All right. Well, welcome back, Vinod. It's been about six years since you last spoke at the Upfront Summit. I believe everyone knows who you are, but I'm going to give a, a <laughs> background anyway. Um, you've been a serial entrepreneur of a couple of very important companies. You then changed careers and became a VC at Kleiner for 20 years um, and investing in some unicorns back when unicorns were not created every week. Um, you then started your own firm, uh, Coastal Ventures, almost 20 years ago now as well, um, raising over $2 billion most recently. Uh, most people would have ridden off into the sunset. What keeps you motivated? What, what are you looking for next? You know, working with entrepreneurs on really important problems is a lot more exciting than playing golf. Uh, it's that simple. I'm really motivated. Uh, after I turned 60, mm. I actually wrote a 50-page document that's public called Reinventing Societal Infrastructure with Technology. And it sort of was, when I finished writing it, I realized that almost all parts of GDP is up for reinvention. Mm -hmm. And that was really exciting to me. I'm very charged up about reinventing everything over the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. All right. Or 25 or longer. Yes, that's exciting. Um, maybe you can share a little bit. You guys were, frankly, quite early into a lot of different themes from climate to AI to biotech, et cetera, before a lot of other investors. How do, you, how do you think about what areas to look for and when's the right timing to jump in you know, when the technology is still early? So we do a lot of fundamental analysis of our own. I mostly do spend my time saying, where are there axes of innovation coming together that really impact an area? So climate, we were one of the first investors when most species weren't investing. You know, when we invested in Square or Stripe or Affirm, FinTech wasn't a word that was used to describe these. When we did Impossible Foods and a number of other food companies, food and agriculture companies, uh, plant proteins wasn't a word. When we did space like Rocket Lab and others, um, nobody was investing in space. You know, when we did OpenAI five years ago, uh, it really wasn't as exciting a category as it is now. So finding new areas where other VCs are not investing uh, is really, really fun and exciting. Of course, dangerous. You can screw up a lot. But screw-ups don't bother me. Uh, I'm never embarrassed to fail. Um, so. That's what's really exciting. Picking all these new areas early before anybody else is investing. You know, today we have a lot in transportation, a lot in construction. Not categories you hear from VCs. Of course, we do the usual enterprise stuff, Okta, Nutanix, mm -hmm. GitLab. So we do all the enterprise stuff, the FinTech stuff, but then we keep adding new categories and, and I think even in software, there'll be new emergent categories the next five, 10 years that are really, really exciting. Maybe we can do a double click on transportation that, you know, other than sort of the previous autonomous vehicle wave, it's, it's not one I tend to hear very much about. And maybe there's the boring company, but that doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. How did you even get into thinking about transportation and, and well, find the right project? So we mostly only do technology. And no matter which area, so a lot of media people here, we did Splash, which is the most popular music game on Roblox, long time ago, five years ago, mm. with the thesis that AI would do a lot of generative music, and that was five years ago. And it's entirely AI-driven music. In fact, their long-term goal is to have a top 10 music hit where new, no human has touched the media. State space doing the things in gaming, all with generative AI to generate scenarios now. Uh, so we do these things early. But transportation, we said, what is changing? Autonomy will change things. And so we have a public transit system designed around how would you do it if AI was the principal driving factor for public transit? Turns out it's far superior and larger than either Lyft or Uber, if you do it. 
We're doing Mark 5 aircraft, so I'd like to say London to New York for lunch and back, same day. 90 minutes from London to New York. Uh, people don't attempt that. Of course, we have self-driving trucks, sidewalk delivery robots, or bicycle lane delivery robots. Uh, all these are pretty exciting transportation areas, and uh, all are enabled by AI. I mean, for something like a Mach 5 jet, I mean, people tend to think of that as only the defense contractors will attempt that, and it's going to take you know, billions of dollars, et cetera. Like, when do you think about this technology is suitable for, for venture versus, hey, maybe that might be too big you of know, a uh, So, one, we take the very long view. You know, we basically started the fusion craze when we invested in Commonwealth Fusion. When was this? Uh, five years ago. Okay. Bob Mumgard was a senior fellow at the Plas MIT Plasma Fusion Lab when I met him. And we started putting this thing together. So it's very exciting now, but nobody was doing it. In fact, the Department of Energy didn't even uh, have this as a category they wanted to invest in. Now they're all over it. So this idea of starting important categories uh, is really, really important. I think one of the other really important sources of energy nobody talks about is geothermal, because everybody is doing incremental geothermal. But if you can drill deep, and drill to four or 500 degrees. Uh, Geothermal is available almost uh, at least half the places on the planet, if not more. So, I mean, you spoke about the MIT professor. Do you guys also go in and incubate companies? Like, how do you work with an academic who's never you know, started a company? Look, when we started Impossible Foods, Pat Brown didn't have a plan, didn't have a company, didn't have a team, didn't have a prototype. He just rode a bicycle up from Stanford up Sand Hill Road to our office and said, I want to change animal husbandry. And I said, if you're willing to give up your tenure and your Howard Hughes fellowship, hmm. uh, then we'll fund you. We didn't need anything more than a half hour conversation. We funded that incubation. We said, we'll help set up the company. We'll help build the team will help you all along the way. And we do a lot of incubations. Um, in fact, impossible, just one example of many, many incubations. Um, and they're very, very fun to do, exciting to do. We only do incubations in areas that can be very, very large. So, I mean, maybe one area where you do see VCs tend to do a lot of incubations is, is in biotech. I mean, there's, there's a whole class of biotech VCs out there who go to labs, work with the professors, they start these companies, they own most of it, they, they parachute in, then executives to run it. Um, how do you think about sort of that model versus kind of the, the, the Pat Brown model was impossible, right? So, it's more founder-led. You know, traditional biotech investing is take a lead compound and take it through the FDA process. We actually don't do that. Mm -hmm. But when we approach a new area like cancer, you know, we talked to Sid Mukherjee, most of you have probably read his books, uh, The Emperor of All Maladies, or uh, Gene, or his recent book, Song of the Cell. And we said, what is fundamentally different that can be done? Turns out each cancer has different metabolism. So you, if you add or delete certain amino acids in the diet, you can differentially disadvantage the tumor. That was our approach to cancer. It's not hand-wavy nutrition and wellness. Mm -hmm. We are very, very scientific, but it's not do the same as find a chemical compound that kills the tumor and kills the rest of you also, only more slowly. Maybe we can contrast a little bit. I mean, you just talked about everything from you know, fusion <laughs> to, to biotech to enterprise software. Um, obviously, they require different levels of capital. Um, how do you think about you know, out of your fund, capital allocation, how much to put into what types of technologies at what time horizons? So we have very long time horizons. You know, doing solid state batteries like quantum scale doesn't bother us if it's 10 years to first product. When we did fusion, we knew it would be more than 10 years to first revenue uh, and a lot of risk along the way. But that doesn't mean you can't create value. 
You know, it's been done in biotech for a long time, 10, 12, 15 years to a drug from the time some professor discovers a lead compound. Uh, but it's not been done in other areas, and it should be done in other areas. It benefits society. So we take a long view. You know, we're doing aviation fuel. That's a 10, 12-year project to get sustainable aviation fuel so today's jets can be sustainable. Same thing with cement. We're doing steel. Uh, we're doing public transit. We're uh, lots of really, really exciting and, more importantly, societally hugely impactful areas. Um, how do you think then about you know reserves for your funds? So when you know when is the technology? I mean, if it takes ten years to get to first product, right, or first revenue. How do you think about capital along the way? How do you think about bringing other partner, you know, partners in to try to be supportive? Well, we always bring other investors in into our companies. We don't try and do things just by ourselves. Um, and if you're making good progress, they're supportable. Uh, the hard part is deciding when to give up on one of these projects. But by and large, we work with other investors a lot uh, as follow-on investments. Um, and our LPs have been very tolerant when something goes past 10 years or 10 plus 3 or however you look at that. Right. Right. Uh, I would say the following. We probably have everything we do, we define as technology-based economic disruption for large positive impact. We'll never do a startup that has negative social impact, at least not knowingly. Uh, and we are pretty religious about that. Mm. Uh, I'd say more religious than almost any other venture firm we know. But by the same token, um, we really worry about, are we making progress on some really important problems? Uh, and, and, and that's exciting and, frankly, a lot more fun. Absolutely. Um, I also want to chat a bit. I mean, again, you're working with some of these founders who are, you know, doing groundbreaking research. They might or might not have had true entrepreneurship experience before. Um, how do you help and support them along the way? You've sort of used this term venture assistance before. Maybe yeah. share a little bit on that. So, in the 40 years I've been doing this, I've never called myself an investor or a venture capitalist. Uh, we like to say we're in the venture assistance business. That means our job is to help an entrepreneur be as good as they can be, and we push entrepreneurs a lot. Uh, and we can come back to that, um, to be as large as they can be. We help them build teams. We help them pick strategies, sometimes help, uh, I spend a lot of time recruiting for our companies. It's probably the single biggest slice of time on my calendar is recruiting for our companies, whether it's an individual engineer or a CFO or somebody else. Um, I, you know, so we have a large operating team in addition to the investment team. In fact, the operating team tends to be larger than the investment team because we are so focused on helping entrepreneurs. Now, I'll, I'll uh, boast a little bit. Uh, recently, some founders did something called Founder's Choice. In retrospect, after VCs had invested in you, how would you compare those VCs head to head? It wasn't industry scuttlebutt. It wasn't what Joe or Jill was saying. It was real voting by founders among, only among investors who had already invested in them. So, out of 400 firms, we were rated number one. And I'm very proud of that because people always say we are very active and involved with our companies. We are very, very involved in helping them build big companies, which is the other part of what we do. You know, I hate it when we invest and a year later we get 3x our money back happened to me last week, and I argued like, hell, don't sell the company, please. We only invested nine years ago, and I don't want a 2x or 3x. So when Crunchbase did, research, some time ago, about a year or a year and a half ago, an article on which VCs 
had invested early in a company, a DoorDash or Instacart to give you, give you an example, and stayed with them when they became Decacons or worth more than 10 billion, we were right at the top of the list. That's our profile. We don't mind failing, but the consequences of success, if you're successful, better be really consequential. Uh, most people avoid failure. Uh, we like to sort of really say, let's take the larger risks. Fusion is an example. Uh, public transit is an example. But my goal is no less than eliminating 50% of all cars in all cities by the 2040s. It's a very ambitious goal. I think it's doable. In fact, it's the only way it'll be doable. And, and, and that's fun to work on and obviously hugely profitable if it works. Right, absolutely. Maybe we can do a double click on the kind of operating team, your platform. I, I took a look, uh, you know, back in 2017 when you spoke here on your website, used the Wayback Machine. I think I counted something like five or six folks on the operating team, and you know, seven, eight, nine on the investment team. Sounds like that's more than more than doubled and tripled. How, yeah. how do you think about the makeup the, of the operating platform and the teams there? How do you want to yeah. grow that in the future? So, my view is founders deserve the best help. Mm -hmm. So we'll hire the people in a specialty area that a founder themselves might not be able to hire or afford. You know, the person who helps our founders with design was head of design at Yahoo and then head of design at Google. No founder, especially a five-person founding team, can afford that kind of a person. Uh, and so we have somebody who can help them, advise them, help them hire junior designers, interview them, they don't know what to look, an engineer doesn't know what to look for in a designer. Uh, so that's an example, the CFO we have on our operating team taken multiple companies public. Uh, the uh, founder can't get that CFO, but wants that experience. Uh, same thing with go-to-market, selling, enterprise sales. Uh, we try and add people that a founder couldn't do by themselves and people who have more time to spend with those founders than an investment partner at any venture firm will. You know, typical investment partner may be on 12 boards, they're not gonna spend that much time with a company. Our operating team spends a lot of time. I spend an incredible amount of time with founders because I don't go on boards. Uh, so I avoid the six hour meetings, and I do one-on-ones with many more founders and much more personalized because I love long strategic things or a really hard hire or some critical problem, cash flow problem. I spend more time doing decks for presentations for our founders than almost anybody I know, including people who are in the job of doing that. I'm changing fonts, colors, design style. Uh, I love doing that stuff. I get very involved. That's, that's not some most VCs as they uh, become partners typically. There's hardly a week I'm not doing a deck for somebody, <laughs> one of our founders. I thought my BCG training was useless, but apparently, apparently it has some use, utility. Um, I, I mean, I actually want to chat a bit then about the governance piece. I mean, you you said it yourself. You don't you don't tend to go on boards, but you guys spend a lot of time with your companies, supporting them in the trenches. We've <laughs> obviously just gone through the last few years where. Lots of public discourse about, frankly, lack of governance at, at a bunch of companies. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of governance. Um, I, I think if you engage as a team member with a founder, you have much more influence than if you're sitting on a board and voting. So I can honestly say I can't remember ever really voting against a management team, ever, on a board. So then what's the point of going on a board? And if you're not on the board, founders are much more open with you about their problems, which is where founders will fail if you don't address them. So much better dialogue, much more uh, active. Other VCs accuse us of being very active and very engaged. But the flip side of it is they vote on boards we don't, no matter how important an issue, mm. 
If a company is getting acquired, we won't vote other than with the management team, right? Uh, and you, you won't find instances. You know, there's an occasional instance where a founding team is split or the management right. team is split. Then we have to come in and say, how oh, should the CEO be replaced or not? And the number of times that happens is reasonable. But other than that, whether it's an acquisition, a sale, a fundraise, should we do it, shouldn't we do it, who to hire, uh, we will have strong opinions because founders deserve that. And frankly, I can honestly tell you there's nobody in this audience who's screwed up more times than I have. And hopefully I can bring the benefit of all my mistakes to a first-time founder. But it isn't the VC's job to sit on a board and vote on things. It should be supporting the management team, help them come to the right answers. And if they don't, you disagree and you commit. Right? You don't disagree and vote against. Because a founder who doesn't believe in the strategy the company is founding isn't going to be effective if, just because the board voted on something else. And so very strong view that there's a hard line you don't cross, which is don't make founders do, or management teams do things they don't want to do by voting. But that gives you license to be much more engaged, much more open. Uh, we have a phrase I use a lot. Uh, we prefer brutal honesty to hypocritical politeness. It is really helpful to a founder to hear good news and bad news. And I hate VCs whose only job is to be friends with the founders so they'll recommend them the next time. That's not helpful to the founders. It's a little bit like my kids. I don't always say yes, but they always know I'm looking after them and I will always let them do whatever they want, no matter how disparate it is. And that's, uh, I think, the right relationship between a VC and the founders. The other thing I would say, most VCs who sit in boards haven't built a company. I believe that most board members today in startups have not earned the right to advise an entrepreneur. And I'm religious about that. Yeah, I think a lot, you know, some investors kind of conflate being influential or supportive with being having legal found, rights. Offending any investors, <laughs> that's okay. If you... <laughs> If you Google the phrase, 90% of VCs add no value, and 70% of VCs add negative value, my name will pop up. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good note to end it on. Really appreciate you taking some time with us, Vinod. <laughs> Great. There Thank you. you. <laughs> good to see everybody. <laughs>